Welcome to another episode of Dr. After Dark. Today, our show is brought to you by our sponsors, Stamps.com and Upstart. I'll tell you more about it later. First, let's get on with the show. Hi, I'm Dr. Drew, and this is Dr. Drew After Dark. Please be advised that Dr. Drew After Dark may contain sexually oriented content and be unsuitable for young children. Welcome to another episode of Dr. After Dark. Again, I'm anxious as ever. And uh, be sure to send us your voice messages at 818-253-1693. And of course, the messages that you send us up by email are Dr. D. R. Drew, Dr. Drew After Dark at gmail.com. Uh, your messages and questions have been fantastic lately. So please, mommies, keep them coming. Today, very special guest, my co-host on Loveline for many years, the great Mike Catherwood. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. This is good. This is going to be... Thank you. This is going to be Woo! interesting because it's it's so comfortable for me, but at the same time, it's weird for me because I also have to... Yeah, you've never really interviewed me. I know. Yeah. I never really ask you these questions. And so I guess we'll get to it. But uh, what's happening right now? What are you doing? Uh, I, mean, I got a new podcast with Jason Ellis called The High and Dry Podcast. And, and it's, um, it's everything you might expect, Dr. Drew. You still going every week up to Jason's radio show? Yep. Once a week, uh, I'm on the Jason Ellis show, uh, every Friday you can hear me there, but this new podcast is like, I, I, we're, we're really, Jason and I are investing everything we have in this. Oh, wow. I mean, we've really committed to doing something different and special because every, as you know, everyone has a podcast. This is different. It's like, we're really, really going next level as far as interviews, as far as how far we're going to push each other, um, with sophomore stunts and whatnot. Uh, it's so give me an example. Uh, we had a tuck off, Dr. Drew. Uh, we had a transsexual um, porn star uh -huh. in as a guest on our last episode. Uh -huh. And um, we got schooled on how to properly tuck our penises and, so, and balls. So who had the best tucking? Yeah. Okay. So yeah. And it doesn't, you... not surprisingly, I was much better at it because I had much less to tuck. Oh, yeah. That yeah. helps. Yeah. And, and Jason's you... big monstrous uh, didgeridoo. Right. It's George Takei's favorite favorite that's right uh it's, <laughs> 60 something m&ms he fit in that bad boy in these four skin? yeah 60 m&ms yeah wow i'd be I just, lucky i'd be lucky to get four drew yeah well and so and so do you wear like a speedo after you tuck and i can and, show you right now no drew, no 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 no, see. no 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 my, my question what, no my question is what I you mean, do drew is no, you, no i know but you, who you, makes you, the best what do you mean by best tuck what does you, that mean you, you just you you, you no, actually no. grab the balls Listen, and then, I, and then also from the back steve do it too then from the back drew see you grab so, balls so, it, so that it, oh yeah you can just, yeah then, yeah I, I let see. I let my bush grow over too. Look, it look from the back, Drew. You can see it's how he peeks through. Oh, that looks painful. That's not painful. No, not if you learn how to do it right. Okay. And we, Natasha Natasha Dreams sh showed us exactly so, how. So Natasha wasn't uh, operated upon. She was nope. not, not pre surgical. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah. so I, I wonder. And, so, and and you know, really, just adding insult to injury. A nice 11 inch cock. 11? Yeah. Wow. But chose to be a woman. Oof. You know, so, and I'm stuck with what you got. Yeah. And, and so um, to, I'm imagining to, to she she wants to go around like that all the time, right? She wants to be a woman. So yeah. does, she, does she have to tape it all up to keep it that way? No, she's gotten uh, like a like a special, like a, like a cod piece almost. You know, like um, when women have uh, breast uh, augmentation and they have to wear like a compression shirt? Yeah. After to, for the swelling. Yeah, yeah. He has she has that for her cock. But it's but it's slung up. Yeah, it's like a, it's like a, it's like a, it's like a thong almost, but it 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 pulls it all back. Yeah, got it. Got and it. there's like a sheath of like oh, there's a whole world I'm like learning about plastic here. in front of it. And and speaking of women, right now your favorite woman you told me is a Mexican weather woman. Yeah, Yannette Garcia. Yannette she might Garcia. be the best. Can human. we look up Yannette Garcia? Uh, she might be the best human. Not just my favorite yeah, woman. Annette Garcia. Well, you move around. You like different ones. I know. Times. She deserves some award, though, like Nobel. <laughs> Why? Drew. <laughs> you know, when we went to Mexico, we were down there at... Uh, Look at her doing the weather and just tell me that their TV isn't better than ours. <laughs> that her doing the weather? Yeah, that's, the, that's a weather girl. <laughs> La Chica del Clima. <laughs> They, she's the, your clima uh, yeah I, 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 <laughs> there's some serious weather some w weather going on downstairs with michael when i see yannette garcia but she, she looks young look at her ass drew i saw it i saw look it. at that look at that that's how she does the weather are you kidding me there's nothing but thousands of mexican men with their head blowing right off their fucking neck every day when she comes on and this morning it's mid 70s in la ciudad de mexico boom 
boom. Ah! Oh my God. That's why you still like to watch Salvador Gigante because, uh, listen, because it was just men being men and women being women. There was no like mess, no fooling around with anything else. I think that do you think she that, she takes me too and just her whole her whole voluptuous ass just, just turns into two double middle fingers. That's what she does to me too. Uh-oh. She's saying, look. Come take a look at my tukus. It looks a little injected upon. Is that possible? I don't think so, man. No, Cuz she real? she wears a lot of like uh thongs and then does like her booty workout. Look at that, Drew. She has a what's called an exaggerated lumbar lordosis. Um <laughs> that's what that is. <laughs> so So Mike and I did, I have an exaggerated boner scarsosis right now. <laughs> um Mike and I did love line for years and years. Uh, and so we're going to take your questions and stuff. We're going to get to that in a second. Uh, what else going on? Anything else to stand up anywhere? Should... No, you know, I, I stopped doing stand up because I can't do it enough to, to be great at it. Yeah. To be really, really good. You got to be doing it night, if not nightly four or five times a week. And my wife's studying right now, so I can't my wife's gone like three days out of the week studying so. acting. Oh, she's at a class of classes every night. So this is kind of my wife kind of fucked up my dreams. Well, yeah. You can say that. Nah. Yeah, it's a team, man. You got to you got to trade off. So no, I know, but I I I started writing a lot more cuz you know the 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 Rudy television show has been back reintroduced back into the world of things. So Oh, yeah. Started writing a lot more. And, you guys uh, ever met Rudy in the back room? You love Rudy? Potter yeah. loves Rudy, yeah. yeah. A lot of people like Rudy better than me. I found that. <laughs> Yeah, like a lot, like really a disturbing amount of people. You like didn't Rudy. bring a Rudy mustache with you by any chance? I didn't know, uh, but I mean, it doesn't mean he can't show up. Okay, well, we'll see, Ru- Rudy, you know, we'll, we'll give a little taste of Rudy. Rudy sang one of my favorite songs of all time. Would smoke more blunts, lick more butt? Yes. Yeah. He um he came and he just brought his guitar out and just spontaneously broke into that song. Yeah. I don't think I've heard that song. Can we? Uh, so okay, so let me talk to Rudy for a second. Right? Okay, okay. <laughs> Rudy, right. come here. Hey, Rudy. Come on, buddy. Hey, come on in here, Rudy. Hi, buddy. Hey, what's up? Hey, fool? man. How are you? Hey, How you dog, been? Like, it's been a long it time. It has been fool. a long time. You feel like you got like more buff. It's good. To, I'd not get more buff. Yeah. I, I've been on a uh, low carb diet. It's been oh, good. damn, low carb dog. No, yeah. no tortillas. No all that nothing, stuff. No you guys, all the stuff you no. serve at Jamba Juice. That's all sugar, nah, man. Dog, I, I'm, I, I, no, I got a special, almost the, like a keto drink yeah, I yeah. can serve oh, you. Do up. you yeah, have Jamba a, Juice? It's like um, beef tallow. <laughs> Some cilantro juice, oh, beef tallow, and some uh, some apple cider vinegar. So so, how's the sad cat's gr- claw? How's sad girl been? My my wife, well, yeah. that, she you know like um she's recovering, you know, from that leg situation. Yeah, you know what I'm you saying. Want to tell them what happened. <sighs> it's hard. It's hard. To I got about. real frustrated. Not like um you know I saw my wife. You were she trying was, to help her. I she know. was like uh, she did like CrossFit. And the fucking Nutrisystem yeah. and it, like uh, Weight Watchers and shit, Didn't all work. that, all that, shit, all that stuff like Oprah pushes. Yeah. Like my wife tried every fucking thing, and she wasn't losing the weight. I would see her at night, dog. I would cry. I would cry. Not yeah. only like the tattooed teardrops, I would do yeah. like real teardrops, real teardrops down teardrops. my face, yeah. dog. Because I would see my wife, she would hold her fupa in front yeah. of the mirror, and she would be looking. She like, look at my fucking panza, I'm so big. <laughs> And so I, I was like, I got to do something. So like I went and I went, I, I, I talked to my homeboy Rug. Oh, yeah. Pomona, dog. Rug's a new, I didn't know Rug gave uh, you the, no, did Rug used to give you the math? I got to be honest, dog. Like he's kind of a shady character. I don't like to hang with Rug too yeah. much, but he's got the scante. He's got the yeah. meth. You yeah, know, yeah, he's yeah. got that methamphetamine. Does he go by another name too? Does he have a couple of nicknames? No, no. You're thinking of his primo, his cousin. Grasshopper? No, Manchego. Manchego. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, Rug. So Rug. Bum, donut, Manchego, yeah. ceiling fan, yeah. carburetor. Okay, so Rug got you the spoke. Scanta. He got you the math. Spokes with the jokes. Oh. Plunger. Oh. That bottle's from a month. That he's kind of cool. I should bring him by. Plunger? A little plunger. Yeah. Hey, so anyway, like I went out to go see Rug in Pomona, dog, and I got I got some scante. I got some methamphetamine, and I just started like every morning. I would wake up before my wife, and I would start putting it in her food, like sprinkling in her fucking horchata. Yeah. In her, like, her huevos and everything, yeah. like and my wife lost 187 pounds, dog. Oh, yeah, uh, it was good. You were you were had. Yeah, my wife lost 187 pounds. It was from pounds, a good place. But she uh, she kind of went crazy she and starts, she, she started picking on herself. She stuff. started picking at her scabs, dog, and then she stabbed my aunt in the fucking neck because she said no. She's like she's like there's demons coming out You're of her a lizard. Fucking, she's there's demons coming out of your eyeballs and shit. I was like, what are you, Alex Jones? You fucking chill out. And she stabbed my aunt right there in the fucking neck. And then but that next wasn't thing the bad part. No, nah, she was convinced there was bugs inside her leg. And so she cut off her fucking leg. Yeah, well. But that was another 65 pounds. Uh, yeah, you know what I'm saying? Like, she cut off her really. fucking leg. So she's recovering. I got uh, her a nice, like, wood, you know. Peg. It's like mahogany, mm, you know, very nice. rich and nice. Yeah. 
it looks good you know she, okay, so. she's good now she's happy because she doesn't have the the food anymore. no nah, she's but i mean like she the neighborhood kids in Boyle heights you know they still pick on her because oh. they see her they're like what are you a fucking pirate with yeah, your peg leg well, you know you know she's just got to hobble home you oh, know from jail sad girl anyway uh good to see you i forget why i brought you in here <laughs> so, oh damn dog guys so, say what's up oh you i know, want like, you to hear your song i want to hear the smoke more because mm-hmm. the guys wanted to hear it the guys I, hear I don't know if i remember i mean talking like almost like a decade ago yeah, that yeah, i, yeah. I, I bust bust that I out why we got into that it was, because the, <laughs> uh, this i remember clearly fool this one Haina, she called up love line yeah. and she's like I, I really like to lick my boyfriend's butt but I only want to do it when I'm high. Yeah, well. And I said, there's an easy solution. Smoke more blunts, lick more butt. And then you sung a song. <clears throat> Smoke more blunts, lick more butt. No need to live your life with your brown eyes shut. <laughs> the key to every young man's soul is some fine ass weed and a lick butt hole. Thank you, Rudy. Thank you, Rudy. Thank you. Well done, buddy. All right, man. Hey, Doug. You know, considering all the blunts I've smoked, the fact that I could remember that song. Yeah, and you like, looked and you're doing straight really good. miracle, you're Doug. Doing good. You've been doing well. It's straight good to see you. Miracle, man. whatever. All Doug. right, buddy. All right. See, you, see you later. Peace out, Doug. All right. Oh, Rudy. Rudy is always a joy. Yeah. Always, yeah, he's a good guy. A pleasure. He's a good man. So, um, people that maybe don't know Mike, yeah, uh, tell them your story of recovery and and uh, drug use and stuff. That. Uh, so yeah, I was like. Uh, the Did worst drug addict extent. you could possibly yeah. be. I was a trash can for drugs and alcohol. Anything that would inebriate me, I'd put in my body. And so Rudy talked about uh, seeing lizards and stuff coming out of people's eyeballs. Yeah. Did you ever have that from Matt? I, I, I was convinced that Conan O'Brien was talking to me, and I took a fr- part of my friend's television because of it. Yeah. And I don't know why, but how that was the solution. Like, if I was going to get well, into the TV But you look, somehow. Do you ever go by the homeless now? You see the bikes all dismantled? Yeah. That's Matt, right? Yeah. They just take, it just makes you take things apart. It just made me... And I, and I I'm not like a handyman and so the fact that I was able to this was like a 90s television too this like big box yeah this gigantic fucking box and I just dismantled that fucker trying to get to the middle of it and I was gonna find Conan O'Brien I was dead set on finding Conan O'Brien and I was gonna talk to him because he was sending me messages it was yeah. what were they that I need to get inside the television <laughs> <laughs> thank you Conan yeah have you met him since no yeah well, he's a it. tall man. He's a very tall man. Very smart guy. That's all I know. Um, so yeah, so meth was a big, big feature. And I loved, and, I love stimulants. Yeah, and so you got uh, meth psychosis. Yeah, I got yeah. meth psychosis a lot. But you know, the things it started getting really dark uh, towards the end. I was living on the East Coast, and I started mixing heroin with cocaine. Yeah, because on the East Coast, especially at the time, there wasn't a lot of meth. Mm-hmm. Um, I so I started. I, I got back into cocaine, and um, I I loved to smoke it. So I would, I would cook crack rocks and I would smoke my, my crack and I would be quite content. Uh, but then I met this guy who, uh, he always had cocaine and he always had heroin and he smoked speed balls. He was way into smoking speed balls, which is when you mix the two. Mm-hmm. And I found that, whoa, that was manna from heaven. It was on. Oh yeah. It was manna and from heaven. And that's when you started but having. I started uh, going to the hospital a lot. Right. I started with, overdosing with like crazy. Cardiac arrest. Yes. One after the other. Yes. All the time. So, so many that I like. It, it stopped being special. And so maybe the 10th time you decide I better get sober. No, oh, no, I not. had nothing to do not. with it. Right. I, it was totally, I, I uh, clearly had a serious problem because I was getting rushed to the hospital all the time and I had no job and no life. Being and, re- literally with your people pounding on the chest, paddles out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, like, like. You were supposed to be in college at the time, weren't you? I was supposed to be studying yeah. stuff. Okay. Which I wasn't. Mm. Shocking. Needless to say. Yeah. <laughs> well, you were studying how to cook meth. Oh, or coke. I mean, you know, it's crack. funny you say that because I, I, I couldn't pass basic 101 chemistry. Mm-hmm. If you paid me any amount of money, there's no way I could go to any Unless. high school. But I was a damn genius when it came to cooking crack mm-hmm. and, and speed balls mm-hmm. and stuff like that, distilling it down. Mm-hmm. It's, it, it's amazing how resourceful I became. Mm-hmm. It's funny how that works. It's funny how that works. But... Uh, I moved back to Los Angeles because I had no, I had nothing. I had no money. I had no job. I had no anything. And I was just sitting on this guy's couch who was the gayest guy on earth. And he never made a move on me ever. Which is weird. It's the weirdest thing ever. And yeah. and I got to be honest, at that time in my life, if he's like, here's a here's four grams, all you got to do is blow me. I totally would have done it. Yeah, I'm sure. I totally would have yeah, done yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I, so I mean, I was in a bad way. So I moved back to LA where I'm from. And uh, I... 
continued using. I, I, you know, I was, I was living with my parents because they were so concerned, obviously. Yeah. But I, I still wouldn't wasn't about to get clean. I, I kind of cleaned myself up in a bit because I had removed myself from that dangerous situation. But I was still drinking every day, and I was still um, smoking weed every day, and I still used as much coke as I could get my hands on. Um, and uh, I was at a hotel in Inglewood uh, all by myself in the middle of the day. I would, I just had like this long night of just blowing lines by myself. Mm. And I remember I was sitting on the edge of the bed watching Jenny Jones and I had a 40 and it was like pff, one o'clock in the afternoon. And now I can only look back on it. I don't remember it within my own body. I can only look as it, it, it only, like the memory only is like it, I'm watching myself on closed circuit out, television. Out of body, yeah. Yeah. I, I'm looking down on myself and I, I can't, I, for no reason, there was, I had no, uh, I didn't get in any car accident. I wasn't going to jail. I, a judge didn't force me. My parents didn't uh, disavow me. I just, for no reason whatsoever, got up and walked to the Yellow Pages and uh, called Las Encinas Hospital mm -hmm. in Pasadena and asked them if they had any beds available. They said they did. And I checked in that night, and that was the last time I used drugs and alcohol. Crazy. You had, you had a girlfriend at the time, didn't you? No. No. Uh, no. And, there was no woman that would put up with that. Okay. Uh, and it, it, the, the, you have a few other using stories that are extraordinary. Uh, the, the couple come to – three come to mind. Okay. One is Paris Pooh. Paris Pooh story. The other yeah. is the talking in front of the mirror for a couple of days. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. That was Amsterdam. That was nuts. And uh, Paris Pooh. Oh, and the other is the guy, the meth guy. That sh that oh, the shooting the cat? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I'm going to Paris, right? I'm going to make... Uh, uh, no, actually, I was going to England. I flew to London. And I, I remember it was so funny because talking to our mutual friend Jillian Barbary about it, about how things have changed so dramatically since 9-11. Flight, travel, air travel. I walked onto that plane with a handful of meth just in my hand, like a bag of meth. In your hand? I just walked onto the plane. Oh, my God. I don't remember. I, I, do, I just remember distinctly like having a baggie of meth in my hand. I don't know why I didn't put it in my pocket. I don't know. Why. I was just like, why should you? Well, I, but that was a great flight, man. I was just blue lines of the hole. I was going to the bathroom all the time. And I, I remember I was uh, like totally inappropriately hitting on the, on the stewardess. I was, I was like 19. I'm and, hitting and on by the way, you roided out at the time. And this grown woman. My, Mike yeah. was a bodybuilder for a few minutes, right? Yeah. You're all roided out. I roided out of my mind. <laughs> Stupid tattoos all over me, and I'm like, "Hey, baby, you want to give some meth?" <laughs> oh no, you, you asked no, but I would, I would totally be like, "Do I need a double, Garkin, Garkin, Trey, Trey, fast, make it a double?" Because I'm, you know, there's nothing you need more than alcohol when you're on yeah. high on stimulants. Of course, of course. So I'm going to the bathroom and I'm doing blow or doing a bunch of meth, and I'm drinking. I'm just fucking shoveling drinks into my body. By the time I land in London, I'm already a wreck. I go to London and I say, all right, I have no friends here. I have no idea where I'm going to stay or anything. But I know from like punk rock documentaries that Piccadilly Circus is like where shit pops off. So I said, cabman, take me to Piccadilly Circus. <laughs> cabman. So I go to this pub. And sure enough, within like a half hour, I find a guy who's got, uh, who's got ecstasy. It's uncanny. How, how yeah, he's got, he's got a bunch of, I was like, I want ecstasy. And he said, okay, I, you know, even better. You buy 200 pills and then you can sell some, pay for all your drugs all uh, throughout your trip. I was like, Done. genius, man. <laughs> so I bought 200 pills of ecstasy. <laughs> and I remember we were playing this bowling game, but it was like on, on top of the bar. Uh, it, 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 it would like with discs and we were bowling and I'm just bowling. I'm eating ecstasy and now everything. I haven't slept in God knows how uh, long. So they're like, I, I keep going, where can I get cocaine? Because that's what I really have uh, uh, yearning for. And they're like, well, uh, to tell you the truth, mate, cocaine isn't really popping off here in London. I'll tell you where cocaine's going really well. Paris. Paris got a great cocaine scene right now. I was like, all right, let's hit the channel. So That night. Yeah. So I get, I, I get these, these maniacs that I met up with, and I don't know at all. And whatever luggage I had, I get on the channel, and I get my ass to Paris. So we get up in Paris, and sure enough, we find... I go to this club called Absinthe. <laughs> okay, I, I remember this distinctly. This place called Absinthe. And it was kind of like this like loungy vibe place. So I go in there, and we there's a dudes, like super suave dudes with a bunch of cocaine. So I buy some cocaine, and that's really the last thing I remember. Mm. 
The next thing I remember <laughs> is I wake up in the in the in the hallway of a hotel, face down. I'm face down in the hallway of a hotel. And a hotel have, you don't know. I no, I have no idea. And it's a nice hotel, so yeah. I know I'm not staying there. Right. And I'm in the hallway of this hotel, and I wake up, and I'm wearing nothing but boxers. Roided out in your boxers. That are filled with shit. <laughs> so now like I need production staff like the Paris Boots. I need you to know that I don't speak a lick of French, mm. and I'm in a place that I don't know where I am with no keys, passport, or money or anything. Well, you're in your underwear. <laughs> I'm in my underwear that are filled with that's shit. Filled with shit. Yeah. So, so I get, I go over to the elevator and I'm like. And I'm like, please don't let there be people in there. Please don't let there be people in there. Please don't let. There. Sure enough, Japanese tourists. I open it. And, <laughs> and I'm like, oh, no, no. I'll wait, for, I'll wait for the next one. Steroids. I'll wait for the next one. So I wait. Finally, I get an uh, elevator with no people in it. Uh. I back my ass up in because I don't want people to see my shit. Uh, and I, I run. As soon as I get out of the lobby, I run. And I remember. Wait, somebody got in the elevator with you, didn't they? Eventually, like people did, but oh. I just I had my back to the wall. I just you're remember in your underwear still. I mean, yeah, like, but still, but it's boxers, and this is France. I mean, the uh, people people through show ding nice dong hotel. all the time. Yeah, I know, like but shit. I probably smelled like right. shit. Yes, Doctor Drew. All right. Um, Door so I, opens, lobby. I run, <laughs> I run like the uh, like I've never run before into the into the daylight into the and street. I, I, I got the front of the lobby. I remember the sunlight burned my eyes like I was a fucking vampire. <laughs> I was like, ah! 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 So it was daytime. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it was daytime and it was a beautiful sunny day. Uh, so I go and I sit on a park bench and I'm like, what am I going to do? In your underwear. Yeah. I'm like, what am I going to do? Full of shit. What am I going to do? They, people were probably convinced I was a bum. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and I was, you know, or, or like a gypsy begging. Um, it's so, like one of those horrible dreams you wake up, you know, where you're like, you're in your classroom. Giving a speech a, naked. Yeah. 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 <laughs> no, this is way worse, actually, because I'm in a foreign country with no passport. With your yeah. In your underwear. Filled with feces. Yeah. And okay. I, I, you know what? And it's funny. Wasn't all that concerned about not having keys or clothes or uh, no passport. I was like, where's those 200 pills of fucking ecstasy oh. and all my cocaine? Okay. Because I know I bought cocaine too. I was like, where is all this cocaine so and you, where is you, ecstasy? You sat down on a park bench. I'm scanning the scene. And I'm like, oh, that looks familiar. I see this hostel. And I'm like, that. That's where I'm staying. That. Something, something's up with that place, okay. you know, and I'm piecing it together. So I go into the hostel. The guy's got a shit eating grin behind the counter. He sees me. <laughs> He's just like, oh, but you, you had a good long night. <laughs> I'm like, wait, so I'm staying here. Is that what you're saying? He's like, oh yes, you are staying here. I go to the second floor, room number four. So I go up there and I'm like, can I have a key? Cause I don't have, obviously it gives me a key. And I, but I walk up and I remember the deadbolt as the door is open. The, the door dead to your room is, is just open. The deadbolt is preventing the door from shutting. Oh, I see. Okay, yeah. so it's it's shut, but it's uh, the door is open. I didn't yeah. even need a key. I slowly open the door and I poke poke my head in, and I'm like, "What is going to be on the other side here?" Because <laughs> I don't, I'm, I'm I'm really confused. I'm really scared. I poke the door open, and there's probably seventy five in this one room hostel room. This yeah. is a, it's a teeny one room place. It was like bed, television, and so like a nightstand. Yeah. There's probably, I'm not exaggerating, probably like 50 to 60 plastic wine glasses. Some of them empty, some of them half full. With, some of them with lipstick on them. Oh. So I'm like, oh, there's chicks here. <laughs> a, a million cigarette butts all over the place. Yeah. And my clothes perfectly folded on my bed <laughs> with my passport, everything like perfectly folded. So at some point, at some point, there was lots of people in my room with me. Yes. And... I was partying with them and we left and I decided I need to take my clothes off before I go. And then when I, wherever I got to wherever I was going, I shit myself <laughs> and then fell asleep on the floor and then fell asleep in the face down. on the floor. Yeah. You missed quite a night, I guess. Yeah. And in part of that trip, you ended up in Amsterdam talking to a mirror for three days or whatever. That trip rounded itself out in Amsterdam. And I just remember having a long, very scary conversation with myself in the mirror. And I was crying. <laughs> Why is this happening to me? And then it, I, I would think that the mirror guy was saying stuff back to me. Like, you know, pull yourself together. You got to get yourself together. Come on. Mike in the mirror yeah. saying that. To <laughs> like, no, I can't pull myself together. Look at everything around you. My brain isn't making any sense. How My long, synapses aren't even fucking firing how anymore. How long did that go for? Uh, 
what seemed like 45 minutes, it was probably seven hours. Just standing in front of the mirror. It was all, all of my time in Amsterdam. I was going to spend a night in Amsterdam. I spent the entirety of it. No hookers, no fucking weed shops, no nothing. Just talking to myself in the mirror. Mm. And that's a full mental thought, breakdown. That's when you thought you better lighten up. Better pack up back to good old US of A. Oh, that's when you went home. Okay, yeah. got it. Well, that's Mike, everybody. Uh, so... <laughs> And otherwise, you had normal childhood, normal upbringing. You lived in San Marino. Absolutely, <laughs> so. I had a totally normal childhood. <laughs> and then, how did how did comedy come into the mix? I, I mean, I kind of fell into it. I, I wanted to be a musician. I really did. I and I was dead set You're on being. A, I was dead set on being a musician yeah. um, when I was, you know, living that lifestyle. Yeah. Um, when I got clean, I got a job at K Rock here in Los Angeles as like a straight gig. Uh, like a, just a means to pay the bills yeah yeah but i but i not a job in radio i was like Van low b the bottom of the barrel yeah. yeah entry level job and i started kind of prank calling the morning show and doing a bunch of hijinks around the station and it got back to kevin and bean and and after about a year of me being there at the station they hired me to be a part of the morning show and i just find kind of fell into a career in broadcasting and comedy and all that kind of stuff and that was uh, 17 years ago, six, 16 years ago. And, and then, well, then you started doing stand-up back. too. And that's been interesting, right? It had, it's, it's. Until your wife crushed your dreams. Until my wife crushed my dreams. Yeah. But I, you know, the truth is, is like, there's being funny on the radio and then there's being funny as a stand-up. And the two, the two are vi very different. wildly different. It's, it's almost like improv versus stand-up. Right. And, right. And then radio is yet another category. It's another, it's yeah. an, uh, uh, and having talent for one doesn't necessarily mean you have talent for the other. If people um, want to check out your, your radio shenanigans, would they check out Bro Down? I mean, what, what can they find on YouTube and things? Uh, I don't even know, man. Is Bro Down out there? Still? Brow Down? Brow, Brow Down, down my, my Armenian rap song? Brow Down? Yeah. It's, and, uh, uh, it's, oh yeah, just, just YouTube Brow Down. Yeah. Brow like eyebrows down. Maybe maybe you guys, yeah, here it comes. Uh, we're, we're, oh, there's Yannette Garcia. Hello, my sweet. <laughs> Tell me the weather. Oh, there it is. Look at that. It comes right up. The, I, I made an Armenian rap song, and I got so much love and so much hate from Glendale. Yeah. <laughs> I got so many people that were like, ah, it's the funniest thing I've ever seen. And then I got so many people like, ah, bro, I stab you in the fucking heart. Should we, should we hear a couple minutes of it? If like, you'd like. like. A couple seconds of it, rather. Can you get, can we find a minute or so? There's surely a video. Yeah. Uh, that'll there probably it is. get us flagged. Oh, oh really? Yeah. yeah. It's weird, like, playing stuff on the internet, from the internet. It gets really? in, yeah, it gets in weird kind of trouble. All right. Well, anyway, you guys, anybody can check it out. We're going to take a quick break for our sponsors. First up is Upstart. Now, most of us uh, found out the hard way that getting into debt is easy. Getting out is hard, especially if your FICO score isn't great. Sky high interest rates can make it difficult to break out of that revolving door. Thankfully, now there is Upstart.com, the revolutionary lending platform that offers smart, smarter interest rates to help you pay off high interest credit card debt. Upstart goes beyond the traditional FICO score when assessing your cre credit worthiness. They actually reward you based on your education, your job history. That's just a smarter way to do this. Upstart believes you're more than just a credit score. They make it fast, simple, and easy to check your rate in just a few minutes without affecting your credit score. Best part, once the loan is approved, most people get their funds the very next business day. That is the next day. Over 200,000 people have used Upstart to pay off credit cards, student loans, fund their wedding, whatever get out of debt free yourself from the burden of high interest rate credit card debt by consolidating everything in one monthly payment with upstart see why upstart is ranked number one in a category with over 300 businesses on trustpilot and hurry to upstart.com slash dr drew to find out how low your upstart rate is checking your rate takes only a few minutes and it will not affect your credit that is upstart u-p-s-t-a-r-t dot com slash dr d-r-e-w upstart.com slash dr drew check it out now and now our friends at stamps.com i love these guys we were early adopters i was uh, sitting in my office one day and i noticed on my stamps on my an envelope i was sending out it's a picture of my daughter and I, th I thought what how did my daughter get on stamps and i, I asked my wife what 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 is it oh it's stamps.com and i thought oh my god she's a counterfeiter she's counterfeiting stamps <laughs> it was too good to be true that you could set up stamps at your own printer at your own computer in your home without going to the post office it's too good to be true. It's true. It's stamps.com. Listen, it, it, nobody likes to go to the post office and, you know, the lines and the park. 
You don't have to. Anything you do at the post office, you can do with stamps.com. They bring all the services of the U.S. post office right to your computer, whether you're a small office sending invoices or an online seller selling, shipping out products, they do it all. Use your, com your computer to print official U.S. postage 24-7 for any letter. Stamps.com, you get five cents off every first class stamp and up to 40% off priority mail. So it makes sense financially as well. It's a fraction of the cost of those expensive postage meters. Stamps.com, it's a no-brainer. Save time, save money. No wonder over 700,000 small businesses already use Stamps.com. And right now, for our listeners, you get a special offer. Includes a four-week trial plus free postage. That's free. It's almost like you're printing money. Free postage and a digital scale without any long-term commitment. And that digital scale, you plug into your, commit, into your computer so you know exactly what you pay for every bit of mail every package is weighed on the on the scale and your computer tells you what the postage is and you print it up on your printer so just go to stamps.com click on the microphone at the top of the home page type in dr drew that is stamps.com enter dr drew and now let's get back to the show uh let's go to some questions here uh cold turkey when when can one quit drinking cold turkey i drink two bottles of wine per night i'm ready to quit however i don't want to pull an amy winehouse amy winehouse did yeah, did it's not a big difference. Yeah, she's, she's not, not drinking two bottles a night. Yeah, and she, I think her thing was a combo of benzodiazepine and alcohol, not not alcohol withdrawal. But alcohol withdrawal can be fatal. It can yeah. be, and it's more than two bottles of wine at night typically. Am I drinking too much now to quit cold turkey? Maybe. Uh, it's hard for me to tell, but uh, I'm glad you want to stop. You maybe just go to an AA meeting, get some support there. Maybe somebody can come with you when you try to stop they can monitor you to make sure things are okay does that sound good to you? it sounds like great advice to me I, I i listen i know that there's many ways to skin this cat i'm just a big proponent for the 12-step programs and i think you know right now in this time in this day and age where people are struggling in so many ways addiction is one of the major ones yes. it's one of the major uh kind of problems tearing the fabric of this country apart i agree and you you gotta understand anytime you're feeling like you're having a problem there's an aa meeting or an na meeting somewhere in your neighborhood doesn't matter where the fuck you are yeah there's an aa meeting and an AA meeting, and they'll come and, pick you up and they can come pick you up you yeah. could you have a whole support group right there of people who are just like you who understand your struggle yeah. and it's all free Th that's it's the part all that's what free. I keep saying. I'm like, people want to save money on healthcare. They now have uh, a, a Cochrane analysis that shows that 12 step is as effective as any other treatment, any other professionally managed treatment. And if abstinence, your goal may be better yeah. in all outcomes. And it's freaking free. And uh, why I would tell you, you not do that? Let me tell you why. Because it's work. Yeah, you got to work. It's work. Yeah. It's effort. And that's why so many people complain about it not being effective. It's because they show up and they don't go, they just go through the motion. Yeah, they don't if do you steps. want the 12 steps to be effective, you got to work it. And I, I'll be the first to admit it's not easy. And you didn't work it for a long time. It took you a while. No, to no, I was, I was lethargic about it. Yeah. You know? All right. Here we go. I have a question about my penis. Nice. I, I have a gentle curve to the left, Mike. I'm over, over. Is that Peroni? It could be Peroni syndrome. Hi, Peroni. I'm over nine and a half inches, so it's obvious. Uh, I don't like the curve. I know the curve is due to scar tissue from my research online. It's kind of, Arr. it's a plaque more than scarring. Arr, they said a penis neck. stretcher and massage in the area can help. Mm. Uh, I know they can surgically correct it, but mine isn't bad enough for that. There are a bunch of other things they can do other than surgery. There's a lot of good stuff now. They can I'm do. sure. Why do you even care? Hey, you, know, you know, chicks don't give a shit. They usually don't, but sometimes the curvature can be painful to partners. Uh -huh. The curvature down is the most painful one. But I wouldn't know about causing any pain with my penis. Urologists can take care of Peroni's uh, plaques really easily. It's not that big a deal anymore. Does, does your staff here know about you, Dr. Drew, about how heavy and how, how girthy you are? How thick and girthy your cock is? Tell us about it, Mike. Oh, you guys have no idea. In his younger days, he would wheelbarrow that thing around. I've, I, it's uh, many a time, many a time I'd go visit the Pinsky family and uh, Susan just be walking like she got done horseback riding. Speaking of wheelbarrow, didn't, didn't, weren't you and I looking at the videos of that guy with the, the horrible penis, the giant penis that had all kinds of disease on it. It was like four feet long. It sounds like something we'd look at, but. Do you remember that? No. Look up, um. Four the, foot penis? Yeah, it's like the longest penis in the world or something. It's like, it's, uh, oh man, after using three foot long. Uh, uh, where is this guy? I think. Huh. It, I think I know who you're talking about. Yeah, he, it's all wrapped up because he's got this horrible skin. He's got a limit. Oh, the Mexican guy. Yeah, the Mexican yeah, guy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, um, yeah and he's wrapped it up like a like a bronzino. There it is. There's the guy. Look at that. Oh my Look goodness. at that that hog. Oh, Look at that monster like thick. It looks like a like a salami you would take home. Oh, uh, he says it's terrible. Oh, I'm sure it is. Yeah. 
Oh my. Um, here we go. Getting help. I loved your episode. Thank you for episode with Chris Hardwick. I love how forthcoming he is with his addiction sobriety and therapy. Mike, you drop top that. My issues uh struggling with depression, 41 year old married, no kids. Uh, I'm not an addict, just um, not where I want to be in my life. I have no directions or goals. I feel like I've given up. I had a mental breakdown a couple weeks ago. I couldn't take the sadness, hopelessness, and frustration. So this is depression. I'm more, I'm more than willing to do anything, but we don't have health insurance. We don't live paycheck to paycheck per se, but anything extra towards enormous medical bills from visit the emergency room, surgery, the IRS. This is not an emergent, enormous bill. In fact, there you can get medical evaluations, psychiatric evaluations, by going to a, a, a teaching hospital and almost for nothing. Uh, it does not have to be very expensive to get at least an evaluation for your depression. So you go to an institution like a, a, a medical school where there's a department of psychiatry and you get an evaluation. Depression, want to talk about that? Absolutely, yeah. man. Depression is, it's a fucker. And the thing about depression is that you, you really feel like there's no light at the end of the tunnel. Right, it makes you feel hopeless and unwilling right. to do anything. That's the depression. That's why medication can be so, so helpful to get things going. And, and it, be, it can provide that light at the end of that tunnel. But the, the reality is, is that um, you're going to have to get up and go on with your life in the face <clears throat> of that depression. There's mm -hmm. no other way around it, because if you just sit back and wait for that level of despondency to end, you never know. I mean, you never know. I mean, there's going to there were times when I, I would have gone weeks without brushing my teeth if I wasn't too able to just bite the bullet and deal you got to deal with it head on you know yeah. what i'm saying like it, yeah you have to be proactive with it it's, it's like any other injury or any other condition you you if any other part of your body other than your brain you would go see a doctor and get it taken care of right and it is not necessarily very expensive if you're smart about it i mean you don't have to go to beverly hills psychiatrist you can go to a teaching institution sometimes it's free sometimes it's a nominal contribution and they have great supervision and great people with good evaluations and the state of the art stuff and go, go get it taken care of. The thing it, about depression is you got to steer into it. Like dri like driving in the rain. You, you got to steer into it because what I'm saying is you can't allow the depression to just, to just continue on and on and on and on being it, this wet blanket. It fuels on itself. You have to, you have to in the face of your greatest despondency, when you think you can't, you have to start meditating, yeah. um, going for walks in nature, doing all these things that I, 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 when you're at that level of de depression, it you, sounds like lip service. Yeah. She says, in fact, she says here, she got books on depression, but the last thing she wants to do is read a book on depression when she's depressed. Totally That's understand exactly that. Right, yeah. But, but you gotta, you gotta break down and do these things that they, we all listen to classical music, go for walks in nature, mm -hmm. get out, get out and, and, and do things where you're making contact with the ground and not and, and hold people, up kind of and get, people don't do isolate. something social, go to a ball game, whatever it may be. But you gotta, you gotta steer into it. You can't allow it to just perpetuate more and more depression. Yours is good these days. My ears. Depression. Yours is, oh. yours is good. Um, no, not particularly, mm. but, uh, but like I'm saying, I, I'm doing what I can. Yeah. You deal I, with it. Yeah. Let's take a quick voice message. What do we got here? It's like love line. Dude. Hey, it's Alex calling from Houston, Texas. Sick. So sometimes when I'm holding my pee or I'm holding a shit, <laughs> I get a cramp right where my gooch is and it stays for about maybe 10 to 20 seconds until it goes away. I was just wondering if I have to like see a doctor or no, if it's man. normal. No. Thanks in advance. That's normal I mean, pubococcygeal spasm. That's called. You're getting, you're getting, you're, you're overtaxing a muscle. Yes. You there, know, it's like a, there's a, you ever do bicep curls and you get your bicep aching. Well, what do you think you're doing a dick kegel for the next last half hour trying to prevent that shit from coming? And I like how he said, "I've been holding, <laughs> I've been holding a shit." Hey, Doctor Drew, <laughs> it's James from Houston, Texas. Every time I'm holding a shit or holding my piss. I get, a, I get a cramp in my gooch. Or and your people call it the taint, of course. Uh, and yes, it's a, there's a whole series of pelvic floor musculature there. Pubococcygeus is the one that goes from the pubis back up to your sacrum and it's, uh, or the coccyx area. And it can spasm. And, this, and the, the spasms can be very uncomfortable and persistent. That, you know, some people get that visceral pain in that area. Yeah, yeah. it's like calves. You know, like when, some, when a small muscle burns, it burns. That's right. Oh, it burns. Uh, I've been seeing this girl for a few months now. During sex, she goes into a childlike voice and calls me down. Oh. It freaks me out so much. I've had trouble a few times. After the third time we were together, I asked her what was up with the voice. She claimed she didn't know what she was doing, that she was doing it. I think she's been self-conscious about it since, but once we get going, the voice comes out. Uh, what is going on? I'm not aware of any molestation, though there definitely was some. <laughs> what do you think? I think he should. I think he should do it back to her. 
talk really about catch her off guard. Oh, yeah. She's like, oh, fuck me, daddy. He's like, oh, yeah, I'm going to fuck you, daddy. Right there in your asshole. Yeah, dad died when she was 19. She's 30. I really like this girl. Whenever people flip into something else during sex, you got to worry about some serious trauma. I, and also, if she says that she wasn't aware of it, that's concerning. That's, that's concerning, yeah. It's almost a dissociative Some weird subconscious thing, yeah. Yes, dissociative. Let's get another voice message. Hey, Dr. Drew. Love the show. Um, I've got a construction-based health question. I do what? construction work. Huh. I was laying tile. And I had grout on my hands. Yeah. Um, afterwards, went home um, after washing my hands vigorously, took a shower, and uh, in the shower, I touched um, some of my skin, mm-hmm. touched my penis, That's and uh, I think the grout had a chemical issue, and the skin's a little irritated. Everything I look up online tells me I'm going to die. So, just curious on what I do to remedy that situation. Thank tells you. Him, tells him he's going to die. Uh, cortisone cream, Cortade, over the counter should take care of it nicely, sir. If it continues, then you gotta have a dermatologist look at it because it may not be the grout, maybe something else. Just lube up with that Cortade and beat off with it one time, you'll be solid. Here, there, uh, I love. Then your... maybe mix in a nice asparagus piss just to blast out whatever may have. Good advice, Mike. Yeah, thanks. Uh, hey, I loved your appearance on Tiger Belly podcast. Keep on keeping on. I was on with I was on the po- Tiger Belly podcast. Yeah, with uh, Bobby Bobby Lee. Oh. And Bobby Lee's a great man. He is a great man, but his recovery was starting to languish a little bit. And really? I, and I got in his case pretty heavily. And Good. I, I, I got a call. I tried calling him a couple times afterwards to see if he did what he's supposed to do. Yeah. You know, we got to get on his case. Uh, been a year from now, I stopped speaking with my sister. Lots of siblings argue and have conflict, but my sister's bipolar. It gets very extreme. Many times in my life, I've decided to cut ties with her after she goes through an intense manic episode where she gets verbally and sometimes physically aggressive. Unfortunately, she doesn't realize other people's boundaries, blah, 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 blah. Uh, she, uh, I told her I needed a space a few days to cool off. She couldn't handle it, threatened to kill herself. I didn't speak to her. I'm deeply upset that I'm not speaking with her. I love my sister and I want to be there for her, but staying in contact with her is negatively affecting my health. I've written a letter explaining how I feel. I think she needs professional support and I think she does, but she's probably not bipolar. She probably has a borderline personality disorder. Mm. This uh, threatening to kill yourself and all that, that sort of borderline stuff. Yeah. And um, she, and some people believe there's a continuum from bipolar to borderline or that they're related in certain ways because bipolars do, I mean, borderlines rather do have very labile uh, affect states, but they're just labile. They don't flip into mania so much. The borderline is unregulated agitation, unregulated aggression and hostility. And that's more what you're talking about here. And that ain't going to get, that gets better with dialectical behavioral therapy, but you're going to have to learn to deal with that setting clear boundaries and not expecting much different from her. Just be around her when you can tolerate it and then don't when you can't. That's all. That's the way it goes. The other thing about the borderlines, they can't tolerate abandonment, which is why she says she's going to kill herself when you say, I just want to take some time off. Right. She can't tolerate it. What do you do though when you're put in that situation? I mean, she obviously is someone who's ill. Borderline family member. Um, Because you you don't want to not you don't want to dare someone to kill themselves, especially if they're ill. You you also don't don't get it's very hard because they they're extremely skilled to get into your skin and they bring you into a vortex, you know, what we call a vortex where they spin you around and they feed you, you get fed into their drama and they're what's called splitting. Somebody's all good and all bad. And you go, yeah, I know that one's that that, you know, that Sally is a bitch. And now you're into their split and now they know they got you. Um, you just got to stay square. Maybe read a little bit about borderline disorder. There's a book called I Hate You, Don't Leave Me. Uh, sort of a classic borderline, how to deal with borderline book. I always used to hate the borderlines when they call love line. That was the, Yeah, you would react badly to that. I don't know why, man. Yeah. I mean, I know why because they're insufferable. But uh, And I and I kind of am cool with them. Well, it's yeah, I mean, because you have clinical training. You know what? I think it's my personality, too. They They... they I don't know. I get along. I've always gotten along with the borderlines. They they will make me crazy. Yeah, like borderlines always do. But I always sort of had an affection for them. Like I could tolerate them pretty easily. It's weird. It's very weird. And that's you know that was the one thing when we you know we had our we had a really skilled team of in the addiction program I ran, and each of us had a kind of a different personality and how we each one of us responded to a given patient would tell us a ton about that per- patient's personality. Yes. Like my charge nurse always reacted a very specific way to sociopath males. And when, when she reacted that way, we'd all go, oh shit, here we go. And the borderlines would always kind of click with me a little bit. So we knew somebody had a borderline disorder. My uh, partner, Dr. Blum, always clicked with the bipolar patients. Weird. It's just, we would just have our own sort of thing with them. If you're Dr. Blum's sister, would you be Dr. Blumkin? 
she would be a Blumkin of his. Let's get another voice message in here. Uh, actually, on the topic of borderline, here is another question. Oh, weird. Mm. I think I might be seeing a borderline. <laughs> her sister, really? I'm very good friends with uh, her sister's husband. Uh-huh. Her sister says she's bipolar, mm. but the description she gives is more like your description of a borderline. Yeah. In my experience, uh, the girl I'm seeing is perfectly sweet and nice and I don't see any of the things her sister is telling me about, but mm. her sister's not a liar. She's not dumb. Right. And uh, she says the girl I'm seeing is not on her meds at this moment, and she's been on Zoloft in the past. Yeah. Just curious what I should do. Okay. Uh, good good question, man. Uh, border, borderlines present differently to different people. So the fact that she sort of presents totally differently to you than to the, her sister, is that that's a borderline quality. Yeah. And a bipolar would not be on Zoloft by itself because that would make her manic. But a borderline could benefit from something like Zoloft. So again, we're just sort of adding the score up to why why borderline's a high, higher probability here. And as I said with the last one, the 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 the, the um you know the mood swings can be very profound in, in a borderline patient. They can look kind of bipolary. And um, the one thing I would um, note, I don't we don't know this man. I don't know anything about him. But borderline's great like, voice, great voice. He's like, what was that that kid from uh, American Idol a few years ago? The country singer shoot he's i don't just like why, him. why on earth would you ask me something about american idol as if i'm gonna you, have the answer good, on the tip you're of my really tongue. good with cultural stuff i understand but i'm i also have a penis that works and i like to put it in vagina which means i don't know anything about right, american good. idol well thank but, you but you have a wife and she does like american idol, whatever um but uh that borderlines also tend to go be a very very attracted to sociopaths Really? Yeah. Borderline, like in treatment, when, you know, if somebody was going to have sex in, in treatment, a treatment center, yeah. it's usually the borderline and the sociopath find each other. Fuck, man. Yeah. Your gig. It's a tough one. Yeah. Uh, let's see. All right. Here's the deal, man. Let, 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 no, I don't want this one. Um, I grew up in a chaotic home, alcoholic addict parents. Both were abusive. I have three sisters and a brother. I'm now 30. I'm a female. A few years ago, I started having a strange sensation in my head. When I hear stories about child sexual abuse, I get weird tingling feeling on my head. Then I usually feel anxiety. It's only when I hear of stories of people being abused as children. Nothing else triggers this tingling feeling. It's always in the upper right upper part of my head. I don't recall sexual abuse, but I'm starting to think something might have happened to me. What could this sensation be? Am I assuming too much, or is this something that happens when trauma has occurred? Um, it's common to have somatic experience, bodily based experience and not explicit memories necessarily when bad things happen to you, but we know bad things happen to you. You had addict parents, you had chaos, you had plenty of trauma. You don't have to add sexual abuse to the list. Maybe you had some kind of sexual trauma also, and it's just sort of evocative to think about sexual issues, but you had more than enough to need trauma therapy. Let's put it that way. Having the chaotic addict, alcoholic parents. And, uh, and having a bodily-based experience with that, it'd be interesting for you to get in an emotionally focused setting with a therapist to see what he or she experiences when you start having, you know, talking about your, your life experience. Sometimes disavowed, traumatized pieces of self get transmitted to the therapist in interesting ways. And, really? Yeah, I've had those experiences a million times where I experience stuff that I'm like, I hear music or see things or hear things that I, or feel things in my body. I'm like, well, that's not mine. I know that's not mine because I've never felt that before and I'll bring it up to the patient. And it's funny when you're in with them deep in it, they'll go, oh yeah, that's where my dad kicked me. Anyway, yeah, he used to kick me all the time when I was three, he just kicked me there. And so let me tell you about, because they're in it with you so right. they don't realize that you're like saying something extraordinary. And it becomes normalized. Yeah, not just normalized, but of course you know what I'm experiencing because right. we're experiencing, you're experiencing this it together. with me. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Let's hear another question from the gallery. What do we got? Hey, Dr. Jim, my name is Christian. I've been dating this girl for six months now, and I'm pretty sure she's the love of my life. What? I trust her complete. Pretty sure she's the love of his life. Oh, yeah. And Uh-oh. we've both given each other full access to personal things to let us know that we could trust each other. Uh-oh. But the thing is, is that for the past six months that I have known her, I always have dreams that she's hurting me, cheating on me, or leaving me. I completely trust her and know that she's not going to do these things to me, but it's almost every single night that I have these dreams, and it's getting to the point where I don't even want to sleep anymore because of the nightmares, really, that it feels like I'm having. Uh, I don't know why it's happening or if there's any way that I could stop it, but 
you could explain that to me. Thanks. Um, therapy, therapy, therapy. Uh, get a formal evaluation. This is more than just nightmares. And Don't marry this girl. Yeah, and, and uh, I got immediate like uh, I'm worried about this guy the moment I heard his voice. I agree completely. And uh, so this is something between you, but it really is something you have to solve in yourself. So please get 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 a get a therapist and let's start working on things. My bet is you already have one or you have had one recently and you need to go ahead and uh, talk with this person about this experience you're having. Do not um, get overwhelmed or lost in this relationship. I, I, you, this is not the love of your life. This is just somebody you're dating. You're young. Uh, don't make too much of this. And obviously, whatever has happened to you makes closeness and romantic relationships overwhelming and problematic. So you need to sort that out in therapy. We got one more question there. Hi, Dr. Drew. Ooh. It's Rachel from New York. Hi, I'm a Rachel. grad student, and I recently started working as a phone sex operator. Oh, my gosh. And hey. I've noticed that a lot of callers have fantasies and fetishes that involve um, pretty extreme forms of humiliation and degradation, which doesn't shock me, but here's my question. While I want to satisfy customers and make money, um, I don't feel comfortable being complicit in real-life self-destruction. In other words, by engaging in some of these really fucked up scenarios that people want to act out over the phone, could I inadvertently be reinforcing trauma or anything like that? I just yeah. um, don't want to hurt anybody. Right. But I don't have a thorough understanding of all of these sexual fetishes and why people right. want what they want. You, so what do you think? Yeah. So here's a considerate girl. Yeah. He, here's the problem. This is why sex work is problematic for the average person because the average person with a conscience and with concern about people and, and who emotionally experience, you know, or, or you know, empathize with people they're sort of around, it is not good for your soul. It will deplete you unless you're in some kind of therapy or Al-Anon or some kind of support group for you to sort of refuel yourself because you are in the middle of working with people who have very serious traumas. Now, are you going to re-traumatize them? Probably not. I mean, this is just how they get their, they, 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 this is a reenactment. They're jollies. Yeah, this is a reenactment of some type. And some people need to do this their whole life, essentially. The problem is you could trigger a reenactment re trauma. This is what the problem is with people getting too deeply into their traumatic reenactment, just going a little too far and all of a sudden they're traumatized again. So it goes from sexual arousal to trauma and they're sort of flirting with that process and you're going to be highly depleted by this, highly depleted. Uh, which is why if you're going to continue this kind of thing, you got to get a therapist. You have got to if you're insistent on continuing it. I mean, this is something that uh, I, I think will af eventually affect you badly or your emotional system because you are an empathic person, you are a considerate person, and you are wor you are picking up on these traumas that you're sort of co-participating co in with people. I was going to say co-signing. You're not really co-signing. You're just sort of allowing them to act out the arousal that's left over from the traumatic past, which again, nothing wrong with that. And they may need that the rest of their life, but you're right. You could also trigger an excess. We used to see us in love line all the time, right? Yeah, absolutely. All the time. Uh, what would you tell her? I, I would tell her be a barista. Right. If you got it. I mean, the, I, I, I understand you're in grad school and this is probably better mo money than you could get doing other jobs. And, and you could probably make your own schedule. I, I understand the appeal, but it's just, it's why this work is depleting for people. Right. It, it affects your system badly, your soul badly. And uh, the only way you can manage it is by, you know, learning more about it and being in therapy and this kind of stuff. Otherwise, it, 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 it eats at you. Or you have to not care, which is not you. That's not who this person is. Right. And you can't become that person. Uh, right. And you, you and by the way, and not caring when you don't care, um, you're usually reenacting some of your own stuff, right? right. Then there's your own traumas that you're acting out. And, and again... No judgment on any of it, but I just see how it affects people. That's sort of my life. Uh, so here's the deal, man. Lately, when I've been having sex with my wife, I've been getting uh, horny hearing my wife talk about other guys she's been with. I don't know if I want to do this. Let's see. She keeps going. I, I haven't been watching porn for about 10 months. What else could it be? So she was getting into fan this guy was getting into fantasies on porn. Should I let my wife have sex with someone else and see what happens? I mean, the general should, answer is going to be no. Should we try threesomes or be swingers? That I mean, that's a question for your wife. Really? Yeah. See what she's into. Uh, and also, the main mommy's really got it right this time. 
I don't know. I'm I'm way 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 less against. I'm I'm not as against the open relationship as I used to be. Okay, why? Because you've seen it work. Because I've started to see it work so much. Well, you've yeah. always seen. You always had friends that did that kind of thing, right? I did. Never never with kids. I'm still yet to find the couple that successfully navigates this with kids. I, I can't imagine it with kids. It's too. It's too destabilizing. Yeah, kids need stability and simple. I, now, one I've seen it where one of the people involved has kids, but they don't have kids of their own. Okay, got you it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. And that's that's where it really gets crazy. Yeah. Where you're like shipping out the wife of your the the mother of your children. You're farming her out and, to and, another guy's and, dick. And usually, it's. In my experience, it's it's really driven by one of the partners. The other kind of goes along this and guy's, one drives it. This guy's fantasies aren't going to stop. Yeah. And he's not going to get him to stop? Well, I mean, if he's... Eh, if this is part of a sort of a sexual addiction, maybe. I mean, you, there's treatments for stuff like this. But well, he stopped watching porn for 10 months. Yeah, it's That's pretty good. considerable. But he didn't do any real work. He just was apt, you know... A, well, what, I mean, what kind of work comes along with that? Uh, SLA, yeah, Sex and Love Acts Anonymous. I mean, you could check out that kind of thing. I mean, that's very effective for people. Free, again, free. But tell me more about where you've seen it work. I'm just... When people aren't jealous about sharing partners. Now, I, I don't know you're about, about... You're talking about Brent from The Stern Show? Is that... Yeah, I mean, uh, he, he, he... I mean, I don't know the we'll, guy. We'll see how that goes. But that's another That's we'll another see. example. Well, like, I, I worry about... When both people, people involved aren't going to get all jealous about sharing partners sexually... I, I feel like, look, I'm a grown man now and I can look back on it and say, look, if you're grownups and you both really don't care, go for it. Experience but, it. But I, uh, when I, people I, really don't care, it's already so unusual. I always wonder what. I've just been able, I've been able to more, with a little bit more clarity, I can divorce myself sexual. I can divorce the two sex and intimacy. Yes. And I can see that you can go out and have tawdry sex that doesn't have any intimacy and saving intimacy for one person that's back at home. I can, that, I can see that, that. See, this is the problem, though, with people that have sexual issues is they compartmentalize. Yes. And compartmentalization is still taking parts of the self and making them not available for the relationship. And so the more you compartmentalize, the more, the more trouble you're going to get into. Well... I mean, I'm, look, I'm not doing it myself, and I'm not, I'm not in the market. Yeah. Um, but I, I'm just saying, like, as time has gone on, I, I ten years ago, if you asked me, I'd be like, Shit, that's fucking crazy. If you well, want to have a happy marriage, it, well, it's not crazy. Just it, I've never seen it. I, I've rarely seen it work on a long term basis. Yeah. It usually, I, I, I mean, like, we'll see what happens to Brent and his wife. Let's just kind of watch that on the Stern Show. See how it plays out. We'll yeah. see. You know, I, I, when I, when I see hear those stories and stuff, I was just thinking, oh, this is trouble. This, I just see trouble. I've just been through it too many times. With it's patients. definitely dangerous. It's it's it's, it's definitely deep. dangerous. It's yeah. asking for I, I relationships are hard enough. That's you, the thing. You, well, that's that's my always been my argument against like uh, multiple part multiple yeah. wives. Oh yeah. When oh, these guys yeah. in like oh forget what's it. the the homeboy in Utah who had like eleven Warren Jeffs. Or, oh what? yeah yeah. He had like eleven wives, and I think to myself like really really being a good husband to one is so hard. Yeah. It's so hard. That's right. I can't imagine spreading yourself that thin. Whereas being a great sexual partner to a lot of people is totally, you can totally do that. You really can. Yeah. But again, but you sort of, and are... I spent, I spent my entire life having sex without intimacy. Mm -hmm. Now I have sex that is, has intimacy. If I were to go out and do it, uh, do it again, I don't see how that would threaten but what that's you still that old compartmentalization. It's compartmentalization yeah, it's, without it's, question. That's still without old, question. And that that is problematic for relationships, generally speaking. Yeah. Is there another voice message out there? Is that it? Uh, we have a couple more if you want to do okay. it, or we could move on. Whatever you want to do. Uh, do you have any videos for us? Or uh, no, we don't have any videos for you right now. All right, so your voice message. I have a picture for you, Drew. Oh well, Mike has pictures. It's it's maybe the worst prolapse I've ever seen. Oh. See, Mike, okay, this is something worthy of conversation. Mike has a thing about prolapse pictures. I'm just fascinated that people do this. Like, why? You want to send it to Nadav and, and have him put it up there? I know we'll get flagged for that for sure. You, you, yeah, you, let's not show any. Uh, yeah, he, he, he texts me pictures that make me nearly vomit. And all I see as a clinician is, oh my God, 
uh, the, this is going to be a big surgery that somebody's going to have to go through soon. Here's my, this is now my t-shirt that you need to wear. Mike. You shouldn't prolapse your anus. Solid advice. And, I mean, it is. It's sound advice. I said nothing bigger than this, Mike. This is like. Okay. So what about like that? Oh boy. Surgery. What, uh, what's going on here? I don't, Drew, you, you got me. You're the doctor. What is that? <laughs> All right, Drew, just show the camera and we'll blur it if we need to. You want to see this? Yep. Uh, that's a gigantic oh, pro no. prolapse. That's not, that's not a... Uh... <laughs> I don't... I don't... <laughs> that's something you get at Fist Fest. Yes, yes, you would get that at Fist Fest. Uh, uh, and again, these are not small operations. It's not like, oh, we'll tuck that back in. It's like you have to go in through the abdomen get into the the area of the, the, the left lower quadrant there where the rectum is and have to do a gigantic surgery to repair something like that. So, what about what about like that? I mean why? Why? Why do you show me that? You're a doctor. I mean, does it really Oh my God. <laughs> I pe these poor people. And why, when I scroll through all your pictures, your mic, this is, you're disgusting, dude. What is going on? What is going on, dude? Are you okay? I, uh, I'm fine. You have a whole catalog. You have an encyclopedia of horror there. Yeah. Sorry, dude. I mean, I, I, I thought you're a man of science. I, I was bringing these to you out of curiosity more than anything. I'm they, not, not they for all, shock value. I, I, I appreciate them, but they're all the same thing. Just, I'm, I, yeah. Well, you know why? Because people are doing this on purpose. That's what yeah. blows my mind. I, yes. don't, I only need to see one to have my mind blown. Okay. I don't need to see 300. Okay. What's, let's get a voice message. Hey, Dr. Drew. This is, uh, my name is James and I'm 26 and. I had an issue that I was wondering if maybe I could get some advice on. I have an issue where I, where I work in an office setting with, you know, just older people in general and I'm um, just a normal office fucking gear cog kind of job. And uh, we have meetings often where, you know, it'll be like an hour and a half, two hours just sitting. And uh, I have this weird issue where I'll just suddenly get an erection and then I'll like kind of pass out the meeting. And I, I don't know if it, it's just if it's just a bunch of blood going down there or something, or if it was something that maybe like neurological or something. But any kind of a uh, any kind of answers would be great. You know, love the show. Thanks, guys. So I I I'm the erection and passing out are not related. Okay, I like I like the way he likes to make the case. Like I I have so much blood going into my penis. There's just I, such yeah. A it's such a heavy amount of mass down there, Doctor Drew. Yeah. It's collecting so much blood. I, I get it. But it is that he, he, for some reason, he's getting low blood pressure and he's swooning while he's at the meeting. And it probably has something to do with the prolonged sitting and maybe blood pooling out in the periphery of your leg. You got, just, you got to get up, move around on a regular basis during these meetings or you will continue to have these episodes. Um, but I, I would also see a doctor about it because you, you worry about there being some underlying cardiac, maybe some congenital pathology, some you know structural problem in the heart or a rhythm problem in the heart. You want to make sure there isn't anything like that going on. So... Well, don't you miss Loveline? I absolutely do. I think people miss us on the show. Yeah. People say it all the time. I get it daily. Yeah. And uh, this is the closest thing we're going to get, I think. Yeah, because someone already does Loveline. It's so strange. Are they still doing it? I don't know. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. I think so. Mm. It's different, though. I mean, just like this is different than Loveline, too. I mean, it's not the same thing. But one day, maybe we'll get calls. We'll come, have you come back. We'll do, like, call-in We should. Stuff. We should yeah. do call-in call yeah. topics. So, it's a, it's just an honor to be in the your mom's house pod uh, in the your mom's house compound. Yes, this is their I mean, world. Here. It's, it's such a, cool. such an honor to be here. I feel I, I, I shivers going down my spine. Really, you're you're a mommy. I can smell the fart mic from here. It's right there. It's oh, right no, over there. Believe me, I know. Yeah. I've got my I'm eyeballing it right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. Maybe you could uh, go deliver some messages. Well, I tried to brew something up on my way over here. I had yeah. a protein bar on purpose with oh, like yeah. a bunch of with a bunch of like sugar alcohols in it, uh. thinking that maybe I'd I'd uh, no. break free, but no, no, no. damn. You're too, you're too pristine. I know. Your genes are too good. Yeah. All those dr all the drugs and alcohol still. Never see a dentist. Not lost a hair off your head. No, no. It's ridiculous. Hair's going nowhere. It's so annoying. I know. I know. I remember, I'll never forget uh, Loveline where Jared Leto actually got mad at me because I wouldn't <laughs> tell him who does my teeth. I'm like, 
what do you mean who does my teeth i don't know i fucking brush them god you, god yeah i brush them he's like are you, are you seriously you're not gonna tell me i'm like what the <laughs> fuck what do you who does my teeth well, dude, it is really good to see you again. It's uh, great to be I, here. You're good, good luck with uh, any more kids coming. Are we going to do another baby? I don't know. I don't know, man. We need to. I would like that. I yeah. would like that. But, you know, it's, it's hard when my wife doesn't have a, a steady gig. Yeah. She doesn't know when she can be fat. Well, tell, tell them who your wife is. My wife is a very beautiful, talented actress by the name of Bianca Kylik. And uh, you would have seen her recently. Bosch. This new upcoming season of Bosch nice. is, is her most recent. Um, and she was forever on. Rules of Engagement yep. uh, on CBS for a long time. Yep. Yeah, I mean, and that, and they syndicate the shit out of that show, which oh. is fantastic. Oh, good. Yeah, we love that. Oh, we love that. Nice. Syndicated forever. It's good. always on like CB, TBS or WGN, like constantly. Good. Well, that's good. All right. Well, uh, will you anything else you want to promote before we wrap it up? The High and Dry Podcast. Please, dry. people, subscribe, listen, download High and Dry Podcast with me and my friend Jason Ellis. It's uh, it's stellar. Check it out, and I'll see you next time. All conversations and information exchanged during participation of the Dr. Drew After Dark podcast or interaction on the drdrew.com website is intended for educational and entertainment purposes only. Do not confuse this with treatment or physician medical advice or direction per se. You must always follow your medical professional's advice and direction. Nothing on these podcasts or posted on this site supplements or supersedes the relationship and direction of your medical caretakers. Please understand, I am not playing the role of physician in this environment per se. I'm educating. I am a licensed physician with specialty boards in American Board of Internal Medicine and American Board of Addiction Medicine.